Wonderful. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for, um, for this London World Book School lecture, whether you're joining online or in person. Uh, this talk will be recorded. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Savage, a senior lecturer at the Institute of English Studies School of Advanced Study. And it's my great pleasure today to host Sarah Warner to speak about feminist approaches to book history. Uh, this is based on a presentation that we hope she would be able to give in 2020, but COVID got in the way. Um, Sarah is an independent scholar and librarian based in Washington, and she earned her PhD in English at the University of, of Pennsylvania with a study of feminist performances of Shakespeare. And she's taught students and courses on, on drama, English literature, Shakespeare, book history, and a number of universities. She was founder of the Folger Shakespeare Library's undergraduate program, and she directed it for about a decade. And she's now co-editor of the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, along with Jesse Erickson. And she is very, very concretely reshaping the field of book history and bibliography and, um, and very much enlarging what it is possible for us as book historians and bibliographers to do. Her most recent book is, is Studying Early Printed Books, 1450 to 1800. It's a practical guide and it goes along with the open access companion, earlyprintedbooks.com. I will put a link to that in the chat if you're interested. Um, given the recent US Supreme Court decision to ban abortion, citing research into historical archives and printed documentation that goes against the principles of academic rigor, to say it lightly, Sarah's talk today has um, has a very special relevance, and I'm delighted that she has adapted some of the content to respond to the ongoing circumstances. Um, the present and the future can very much depend on the interpretation of the past, and bibliographers and book historians now can play an increasingly important role by recovering voices that have been deliberately written out of the historical record. And I uh, hope you will join me in welcoming Sarah and learning more about her, uh, her approach to a feminist praxis for bibliographical research. Um, if you have questions, uh, please do feel free to type them in the chat as we go, but we won't respond to them until after the lecture. And then you'll be welcome to uh, raise your virtual hand, um, or if you're attending in person, Elizabeth Darnley will be able to assist, um, and we will answer all questions in the order received. Uh, with that, I will disappear. Let me um, remove myself, and I will hand over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that really warm welcome um, and for the original invitation and for the opportunity to uh, come back and revisit all of this um, a couple of years later, in which the world has really felt very different. Um, I want to thank Elizabeth Darnley as well for helping out with um, sponsoring and helping with the logistics on this. Um, and also to the audience, um, thank you for coming, whether it's the, the end of your day because you're over in Europe or if it's in the middle of yet another day of um, Supreme Court opinions here in the United States. Um, there's a lot going on in the world and I appreciate you taking the time to come and have this conversation with us. So I had thought I would start this talk the way that I usually do with um, the usual story I tell about the origin of this FemBib project I've been working on, the tale of why I got invested in what feminist bibliograph bibliography might be. But that was before the legal framework in which I exist as United States citizen finally broke apart to reveal a new reality, one in which I, as someone with a uterus and ovaries, exist as a person only to the extent that I might have to give it away in order to become an incubator. My bodily autonomy, my personhood, my right to control what I do with my own body and my own life isn't mine after all, but only something that I hold in abeyance. And because I have almost always, by virtue of my reproductive system and my sexual activity, been in a state of maybe or maybe not pregnancy, I am now almost always in a state of maybe or maybe not personhood. Um, a quick aside about this maybe, maybe not, the way fertilization and implantation and counting gestation works, most pregnancies aren't registered as such, as a missed period or a chemical change, until at least four weeks of gestation. If you haven't been pregnant or haven't been avoiding getting pregnant, you might not realize this. Gestational counting starts from the first day of your last period, not the date of ovulation. So the earliest you can know you're pregnant two weeks after you've ovulated, and in theory, the first day of your missed period, you are already four weeks on. 
I say this in part because it's why the six week limits that are now going into effect in some places in the United States are so insidious. Six weeks, a person might think, that's plenty of time to miss a period and decide what to do. But no, six weeks is at most two weeks. Language and counting matters. For more than half the world population, every two weeks, we rotate between definitely not pregnant and maybe pregnant until the question is either resolved by pregnancy or multiple layers of birth control, and we deserve the right to take care of ourselves. Anyway, here I am today, probably a person because I am probably not pregnant thanks to age and my IUD. I'm also probably a woman because that's pretty much how I feel about myself. But I also say probably because being a woman can be surprisingly complicated. There are behaviors you should or should not exhibit, personality traits that you should or should not have. And if you move from, say, one community to another, you might find that behaviors you had learned as being totally appropriate for women are, in this new group, completely inappropriate. Do you smile with your teeth showing or not? Do you make eye contact? Do you wear pants? Do you show your hair in public? Do you show the right amount of bare skin or too much or too little? None of that is straightforward and all of it is constantly monitored. When I was in elementary school, this is just the first of a number of slightly embarrassing stories I'm gonna tell about myself, but that's what I live. When I was in elementary school, I went to a friend's birthday party and we played one of those stupid games that you might've played at girls gatherings when you're at the age of trying to figure out how to be. At this one, it was sort of a quiz from probably not Cosmo, but you know, like a Cosmo-like quiz. And at some point the question asked to the group was, how do you hold your hands when you're looking at your nails? The entire group flipped over their hands to look at the backs of them with their fingers extended. I immediately curled my fingers in over my palms and looked at my nails that way. And that's when I learned that I was not good at being a girl. That's actually origin story number one for this project. Um, and I hope, I trust you all recognize what a stupid exercise that was. And who, who, who decides, also times change. I can find a lot of pictures now, of people going like this to show their manicures. But you know, in the 1970s, I don't, in the eighties, I don't, that was a different time. Anyway, origin story number two for this project is this. My PhD was on Shakespeare and feminist theater and it was called Act Like a Feminist. I had some throwaway line in my preface about, realizing how realizing I was a feminist made my life so much easier. And when I showed this draft to one of my advisors, Barbara Hodgson, who I miss a lot, a wonderful scholar and mentor and a fierce feminist, Barbara wrote in the margins of my draft something along the lines of, huh, are you sure being a feminist has made my life so much more difficult? And it probably did for her, and it definitely can for others, the activism and arguments and facing male sneers and anger. But for me, being able to take, oh, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, being able to, uh, what's that? Ah, but for me, I'm so sorry. But for me, being able to take what I had always felt and to find a name and framework for it, what a relief. It wasn't that I was bad at being a girl. I was good at being a girl the way I wanted to be, not the way they wanted me to be. Feminism gave me a way of understanding the world and my current and potential places in it, a way of arguing and resisting and making my own path. I suspect if you're listening to this talk that you too are someone who is aware of the longings people often have to make sense of things. If you're a bibliographer, you might not also be a philosopher. But if you're someone who is curious about how things work, you probably are also curious about why things work that way. Why is this book put together in this way? Why does this sheet exist in two different states? Why do we care about collational formulas for the letterpress books, but not for the intaglio plates in them? All of that is a longing for a methodology to go along with our methods, a wish not only to count the leaves in a book, but to understand why it's important to count some leaves and not others. A way of making sense that isn't random, but meaningful. A way of making sense that isn't necessarily rigid, 
though needlessly rigid, but that allows us, maybe even encourages us to stop and wonder, but shouldn't I also be counting these other leaves? What happens if I do? My desire for a feminist bibliographical praxis is the desire to find a way to make sense of the work I do both as a scholar and as a person finding her way in the world. A desire to create a way of working that might help others also understand and expand our sense of the possibilities of what's around us. I'm gonna pause here to state explicitly what my feminism is since it's become very apparent over the years that different people use this term in different ways. My feminism is inclusive of race, sex, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, religion, ability, and class. My feminism is always political. And my feminism is always striving to improve the world. I want to emphasize one point in particular since it's a hot point and it makes me furious. Sex is not gender. Trans women are women and the attacks on women's right to control their lives are the same attacks on trans people to prevent them from controlling their lives. What this means for my life is that I live through a feminist framework that strives to free everyone from the constraints that gender places on us and that the scholarly work I do should reflect the values that shape how I engage with the world. What this means for my bibliography is that I think all textual artifacts should be part of a feminist praxis and that all people can be part of this work. This is a good time to consider another set of definitions. What is bibliography? The simplest answer is that it's the study of books and their material incarnations. W.W. W. Gregg's answer in 1945 was, the object of bibliographical study is to reconstruct for each particular book the history of its life, to make it reveal in its most intimate detail the story of its birth and adventures as the material vehicle of the living world. And that's often the way that I've taught book history, asking my students to culminate their research seminars with the biography of their book's life story. But it's also a definition that is very focused on books. And as a um, relevant aside, I don't wanna hear any more intimate details of birth stories. People who have given birth have shared enough intimate details of what happens to our bodies and no one should have to share those moments with anyone else in order to be seen as a valid person. In 2020, for the Bibliographical Society of America, Thomas Tanzel wrote a lovely account of what bibliography does, complete with characteristics of different approaches, including analyzing physical um, clues of material objects of text, describing the material artifact, determining the relationships between books carrying the same works, and writing histories and technical studies of the materials and processes used in bookmaking, book selling, and book collecting. You can find that definition of his on the um, Bibli Bibliographical Society of America website. His expansive de definition ends with a more human-focused answer than earlier bibliographers might have provided. What links all bibliographical pursuits is an understanding of the significance of books as tangible products of human endeavor. And a quick aside here is that Tanzel uses books um, in this um, piece that he produced the same way that I'm using books in this talk and when I use books always, which is the best handy term that we have for textual objects, be they codices, scrolls, tablets, or digital. Um, the problem that we refer to everything as books is a problem and I don't have a solution to that except to just explicitly state this is how I'm using the word. What I hope is clear from all this is that bibliography provides the basis for all other kinds of textual work. Can't really understand the connections between a work and its audience or the intentions of an author or even the words on the page if you don't know which text an audience was reading or whether a published text derives from an author or whether those words on the page are always the same words and other copies and editions of the work. Not everyone has to be a bibliographer, but we need to draw on bibliographical work in order to do anything else. My work as a bibliographer can be summed up as trying to inspire in others a desire to explore how textual artifacts can bring us closer to understanding how people and technologies and cultures work. That seems both overly broad and a tad ridiculous sometimes, 
Most bibliographers probably identify a specific field or research question as their framework. And I do have a field, it's the first centuries of the printing press, which in and of itself is actually kind of ridiculously broad. But my research question is more about pedagogy than identifying type or recruiting the output of a printing house or naming early booksellers. All of those things are great questions to work on, but they are not mine. My burning question is, how do I get you to want to do this? What can I do to make you see the possibilities and joys of this field? How can I help you want to make bibliography enticing and exciting to newcomers? One output of that research question is my book, Studying Early Printed Books, 1450 to 1800, A Practical Guide, is for anyone who has to learn the basics of working with these objects. Anyone who needs to understand how early printed books were made and why it matters that we know these things. Anyone who needs to be able to find and access early printed books. Anyone who needs to show up in a reading room feeling like they have the skills to be able to make sense of the books in front of them. I wrote the book I needed to teach with since that book didn't exist. And my book was profoundly shaped by my experiences in the classroom. But it was also shaped by my own experiences of trying to learn basic bibliographical skills long after I'd left graduate school. So here's another origin story back from when all things bibliographical were Greek to me. At some point after I'd become a regular reader at the Folger, but before I started diving into book history, an out of town friend needed to fact check the quote. So she asked me if I could pull up a book, confirm the passage and let her know where in the book it occurred. An easy enough request. But at that point I was not working with anything printed before you know, 1910 or so. And while I had some basic familiarity with old books from my graduate courses, actually just one course with Rebecca Bushnell, it had been a long time since I'd looked at any. Reading the text wasn't a problem for me. That actually was a book that was in English, but I could not remember what the deal was with signature marks. As in, I knew that I had to cite the page and that I could do that with those numbers printed at the bottom, but I did not know what to do with recto and verso. Was the page opposite B3, B3 verso or B2 verso? It's such a basic skill, but I did not have it at my fingertips and I was much too embarrassed to ask anyone for help. I didn't yet know other readers and I didn't want to expose myself to the librarians as ignorant. Librarians actually wouldn't have judged, but I did not know that. There didn't seem to be an obvious resource to figure this out. So I did what I always do. I figured out how to find other examples of what I needed to know and taught myself to apply that knowledge. I pulled out an article that referenced early printed books. And then I called up some of those books to look at the passages quoted. And then I worked out a pattern that helped me understand how to use signature marks as a reference system. It was a roundabout way of figuring it out, but it worked. I didn't embarrass myself. And when it came time to teach my students how to do this, I knew both what they needed to know and what mistakes you make when you're trying to learn. Now, hopefully when someone else is in my shoes, they'll be in a reading room that has my guide on its reference shelves and the title of the book and its orange spine will sing out to them, me, I'm the guide you need to help you do this. I'm practical. So adding to the list of things I probably am, I am probably a bibliographer, depending on your definition, I suppose, and depending on how I'm feeling. Sometimes I'm a bibliographer, Sometimes I'm a teacher whose field is bibliography. I definitely relatively recently wasn't a bibliographer and sometimes I still don't think I am. Another origin story. I started teaching myself book history and bibliography around 2005 when the Folger hired me as a consultant to explore the possibilities for the library to create an undergraduate program. By the time I taught my first course on early modern books and culture in 2007, I was already frustrated with Philip Gaskell's A New Introduction to Bibliography. It was the only book I could find that offered the depth of detail I wanted about the hand press period, but it was also really a nightmare to use as a beginning textbook, full of minutia that are hard to understand unless you already know how to understand them. I spent a lot of time obsessively reading it, then taking students through the basics of printing, sending them off to read sections, and then taking them all through it again, 
all while assuring them that they will get it. They just have to trust me and themselves. So when an acquisitions editor from Blackwell asked me what I thought the field of book history needed, I said, an easier Gaskell, something that you could actually teach today's undergraduates with. And Emma Bennett, whose faith in this project was a real gift to me, said, oh yes, I've heard that from others as well. Do you wanna write that? And I immediately and emphatically and repeatedly said, no, no way. I am not a bibliographer. I do not know enough. I cannot do the things that bibliographers do. And I kept saying that for years until I finally realized, you know, I can do this. I do know enough because I'm an expert in what students new to the field need to know. And then after a lot of trials and tribulations, I wrote that book. I have on other occasions talked about how nerve wracking that process was and how anxious and full of doubts I have been about the inevitable errors that are in it. Mistakes are part of living and part of printing. There's just no way around it for better or for worse. My point with this story is to pause over how closely linked trying to understand bibliography was with feeling like I couldn't own my expertise. If bibliography was a house of experts and excitement, I couldn't find the door to let me in because it felt like I had to already know where the door was hidden among the vines in order to be able to open it. I didn't feel hostility in my search for that door, but it also took me a very long time to figure out how to get into that house. And that is one of the foundational principles of my feminist praxis, to minimize the barriers to doing bibliographical work. Ours is a funny field based on skills that were for a couple of generations not taught in postgraduate programs, and that even now you often have to go elsewhere to learn, places like London Rare Book School. The specialized knowledge had gone out of fashion, especially in the United States, in part because it refused to consider itself as belonging to the world of theory and feminism and black studies and queer politics that other parts of academia were exploring. It is only just now, over a century past the codification of the bibliographical field, that we are seeing studies that can be described as black bibliography and queer bibliography and feminist bibliography. Only now, when the study of English literature and of history and even of print culture have long since been immersed in this work. Bibliography strove in its formative years to distinguish itself from the work being done by collectors and librarians by insisting on its scientific objectivity, on creating a practice that was replicable and built on clear principles of truth-seeking and precision. Bibliographers were not dilettantes or catalogers. No, they were professional men of learning that objectivity and boundary setting might have helped gather the field into itself as it, was being, as it was being codified, but it also expressed itself as a resistance to change for a long time. And it leaves an uneasy legacy for those of us who are not professional men of learning. I'm gonna come back to that, but I want now to think about what types of objects the field has encouraged us to study because these origins have also created problems for those of us who might wish to study texts other than the canonical ones, other than the world of incunables and Renaissance and Restoration drama that formed bibliography's basis. Certainly in the decades since Fredson Bauer um, wrote his book on descriptive bibliographical practice, since then bibliographers have expanded its utility for 19th century works, for instance, and American imprints but any field's roots shape how it grows. So let's take a look at some of the assumptions of descriptive bibliography as it was collated into a field by Bowers and his successors. First up, another definition. Descriptive bibliography is a set of practices and principles guiding how we describe printed textual objects using bibliographical features to determine how a book was printed and what the ideal copy is, that is, how the states and issues of an edition are related to each other. There are a few key things to note in this. It focuses on print and text. It finds evidence in the object itself and not archival records. 
and it expresses those relationships in part by trying to reconstruct a copy as it was intended to be at the moment it left the printer's or publisher's hands for distribution. It's easy when you've been immersed in this work to be so accustomed to these practices that you miss what is omitted from it. So let's flip this briefly to point out what is not included in standard bibliographical practice. It's not interested in manuscripts. It doesn't care about images, especially when they were produced separately from the text. And it doesn't care about what happens to books after they leave the print shop. Let's look at a couple of um, quick examples of, of what I mean. And also you'll get a chance to look at some pretty pictures instead of these blocks of texts for a moment. So what this means in part is that descriptive bibliography does not consider part of its concerns anything that was not done on the letterpress back for the hand press period. So this, um, a collection of uh, solos for a violin is entirely on engraved plates. The only reason that it is cataloged in the ESTC is because it has a, a letterpress title page. Or maybe it's a letterpress imprimatur. I cannot, I can't remember. There's one tiny little bit of it. That not part of descriptive bibliography. It's not interested in plates either when they are parts of books. Um, I really hope you guys are seeing that full screen and not a cutoff version of it. If it's cut off or something, um, Elizabeth. It is full screen. Thank okay, you. perfect. Thank you for that reassurance. Um, so it's not interested in plates when they appear in in books. This is a copy of a 1776 um, book by Soldini on the on um, the souls of animals. Basically, you don't really need to worry what it's about. But I want to point out is on the right, it has a letterpress. On the left of the opening is um, this Italian, this in incredible, insane, I don't know what it's showing us, Italian thing, I don't know what the animal is in the background, it kind of freaks me out. In other copies though, you get different plates that appear from the letterpress. So here is the another copy of the same book. You can see it's the same text that's starting, but it has a different plate facing it. Plates are produced separately, they're um, bound in separately, they're not part of a stable thing, and so they've become, um, treated as, as not important to sort of worry about. Uh, we could talk about that later. I'm sure some of you have strong feelings about that as I do. Um, but it's also not really interested in images, even if they are relief images that are printed at the same time, like a Woodbach um, on the printing press. I mean, it has taken, bibliographers have long been interested in Woodblocks in terms of printer's devices, in terms of borders, because they can be used to trace printing shops and to sort of connect printers that practice of printing with each other. But in terms of the images themselves, despite the fact that you get things like this, an illustration of corn cockle, which first appears in 1568, but you can see the exact same um, woodcut being used in 1618. And this is in 1633. Despite the fact that images are repeated, it took generations for there to be an initial gathering, and that work is still happening today, of trying to be able to trace the reuse um, of actual blocks and plates and cuts. Um, the other thing that bibliography has not been interested in is and has not really known how to handle are those corrections that are made after the printing process and before distribution. Um, and Margaret Cavendish is one place that I can point to an example of that happening. Um, I've been thinking about this in part because I've been um, reading the work that um, Liza Blake has been doing on what Cavendish could have to offer for um, feminist bibliography. And these corrections that you see in here, the handwritten correction at the top and pasted and slip on the bottom image, those are happening after she's had her books printed, but before she has distributed them to people. And Cavendish has not gotten very much bibliographical attention, even though um, she's super interesting. So, these bibliographical parameters about what's interested, focus on text, the focus on a certain type of printing practice on a specific moment of distribution um, before distribution and correction. These parameters come from the field's interest in answering questions that were often driven by a fascination with Shakespeare and establishing which of the printed versions of his plays were the closest to what he intended. This is why it cares about text and not image and on the workings of letterpress print shops. There are very good reasons why descriptive bibliography forms the basis of so much bibliographical and textual study and why it studies the selection of objects it does. You can't compile lists of texts to study if you don't know what you're putting on that list. Is it a work's first printing, second printing? Maybe it should be the second edition. You can't understand how the copy you're looking at relates to other copies of that book 
until you understand where it fits into that work's genealogy. And you can't edit or analyze a text if you aren't sure whose words are on the page, the writers, the compositors, the result of pied type. Without this level of close observation that descriptive bibliography supplies, we wouldn't have answers to many of the questions that bibliographers have wondered about, like were Shakespeare's plays pirated? And how can we get back to Shakespeare's words without this darn veil of print? I'm kind of laughing, but I'm also serious in pointing out that this focus on Shakespeare has shaped much of how bibliography was developed and in wondering whether that serves us well. At the same time, I do wanna make sure that we remember how much of what we know about the practices of early modern printing come from the long hard work of past bibliographers. We are all standing on their shoulders and their work forms the basis of much of what we know about the history of Western printing and the book trade. So how did our founding bibliographers answer these questions about past printing practices? In part, by looking at lots and lots of books. One of the most important principles of descriptive bibliography is that you want to look at as many copies of an edition as possible so that you can have a full picture of what the variations between them might be, and then you can figure out what those variations might be telling us. And that makes sense. If you look at only three of five extant copies, you might miss the cancel that appears in copy four and the variant in print on copy five. It's also a mammoth logistical problem then and now, this emphasis on looking at lots and lots of books. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Looking at lots of books is not only part of describing an edition, it also has been how we've come to understand what early printed books are. Early bibliographers examined books, came to conclusions about how they were made, and then used those conclusions to interpret and assess other books. And then people like Philip Gaskell and me use those conclusions to write books, to train people to study other books. I find it easiest to think about this process along these lines. You look at specific instances of books to create general principles that you can apply to other books. It's one of the things that makes bibliography a useful tool. You don't need to examine all instances of printed texts in order to understand the general workings of printed texts. And it's a pretty standard way of thinking about the scientific method. Look at some number of things, derive a principle of how they work from that observation, and then use that principle to understand the things you haven't looked at yet. But there are also some tricky bits to this process. For starters, it's no accident that I chose icons that look similar for that top row but that the, that the items all on the bottom, the ones that are being analyzed by the principles derived from the books at the top, those icons all look different from each other and from the books at the top. One of the dangers of working from a small set to derive practices and theories for working with a larger set is that the smaller set often does not represent the full variety of the larger. Here we have bibliographers focused primarily on English early modern playbooks, working with those and related texts from the period up at the top. And here we are at the bottom, using those principles to understand all sorts of textual objects, including broadsides, almanacs, jobbing work, books with moving parts, books that are composed of plates, hybrid books that are both manuscript and print, books that have been altered by their creators in that moment between production and circulation, and maybe even newspapers, stereotypes, offset flyers, and eBooks. Put another way, descriptive bibliography depends on books being repeatable objects, things that exist in enough copies that the variations are noticeable. But what if textual objects aren't repeatable? It also focuses entirely on acts of production, but what if the importance of some objects is in how they are modified in the hands of users? In other words, are the concerns that drove those early principles useful to us today? The texts that formed the basis of descriptive bibliography are primarily canonical, male-authored, bound codices. What are the biases of those texts that might be shaping how we understand, say, Melusina Trench or Phyllis Wheatley-Peters? 
What do we do with texts that only ever circulated in manuscript? Texts printed on wood blocks over a period of years and years. Texts that are not ink on surface, but knots in thread. Sure, we can say that those aren't the concern of bibliography, but what does it do to our field that the basic terms of our analysis don't speak with the basic terms of analysis of other textual scholars? And when those other categories of text are categories where we find a lot of work by people other than white men living in the West. My point isn't that bibliography cannot or should not address these other categories and concerns. My point is that it was not built to do that. And that maybe instead of devoting energies to expanding the terms of descriptive bibliography and producing more and more studies of the Renaissance period, we should ask ourselves if there are other methods suited to our work. Do we wanna wrest the work of anonymous authors circulating in manuscripts into this framework? Do we really wanna make Chinese woodblock books squeeze themselves into fitting into these principles? Are we just gonna keep ignoring textual artifacts that don't belong to the categories of texts that we were studying 150 years ago? Let's return to my earlier comment that the aims of bibliography have been the aims of professional men of learning and what this means for those of us who are not in that category. Anglo-American bibliography has of course included women among its practitioners since its earliest years. And some of the resources we rely on today were created by women and scholars working on different categories of texts. Henrietta Bartlett, Dorothy Porter, Catherine Panzer. These are some of the biggest 20th century names in, in the field. And there is increasing research being done on their work and histories, as well as those of other women involved in bibliography and the book trades. I have no doubt, and you shouldn't either, that women were involved in the making and circulation and study of textual artifacts since they first began to be made and circulated and studied. So my point is not that women have not done and cannot do any of this work. But bibliography, as we have been practicing it, requires a huge amount of time and money and travel in order to do it. The premise that you must look at as many copies as possible and that you must look at them in person means, for instance, that anyone with any sort of caretaking responsibilities has a hard time doing that work. If you have young children or teens or a partner or elderly parents or anyone who needs you to help feed or drive or just generally make sure they stay healthy and alive, if that's your life, you can't do this work easily or sometimes not even with difficulty. And women are overwhelmingly the ones who are primary caretakers. Let's talk about the ways in which basic bibliographical work does not tend to be rewarded in academia. In many places, doing an addition will not count for a thesis. Compiling a descriptive bibliography will not count for promotion and tenure. Even publishing a bibliography of understudied works, something that future researchers, researchers will build off of and create new fields from, those bibliographies have a miserable time finding publication venues. How do you do this work? if it doesn't get you a degree or a job or the funds to do the necessary research. And should we, I'm sorry to say, talk about the state of academia and research in general? Jobs that offer stability and a living wage are few and far between. You can function as an independent scholar, but if you want to get money from a funding agency for it, you almost always have to give up all your other paid work while you're on the grant. That's a system that can work great for standing faculty who have a salary and benefits and a multi-year contract. But for the rest of us, completely giving up the hustle that makes up your income, whether it's a freelance work or a day job doing graphic design, giving that hustle up isn't really an option. And for those of us in the United States, where access to healthcare is often predicated on having a job that provides medical insurance, Anything that disrupts your benefits can have lifelong consequences. And again, women are overwhelmingly the ones who are working in precarious jobs, which makes access to research funds absolutely a feminist issue. Oh yeah, and one last thing, let's note that rare book spaces are often designed in ways that model gentlemen's libraries that are guarded by people who are too often the only people of color in the library 
and that have security practices that require monitoring people's appearances and behavior. Now imagine you are someone who is a first generation student or who is black or who is genderqueer. Imagine your comfort levels and constantly entering these spaces and being stared at. I'll wrap up on two final notes. The first is that it is important, necessary even, to have more people doing this research from a broader range of perspectives. Part of that is about different experiences allowing people to see different things in our collections. Jen Chaplin's incredible account of her research into Carson McCullers and her reflections on her own queer life is a powerful example of what this means. Without Chaplin's own experience of being queer and closeted, she would not have recognized the signs in McCullers' writings and archives that led her to see McCullers as queer and to find the love letters that she and her partner sent. And without seeing McCullers in the archives, she makes clear in her memoir, Chaplin would not have been able to understand herself to reshape her own life, to create the fulfilling and creative and scholarly life that she's living now. Especially now, we need to point to our past and show its full variety that women and queers and trans people and people of color have always existed, that we've always been part of life and part of books and part of history. And when we find that, hmm, just pausing because I'm wrestling with the Supreme Court once again. Um, and when you find that words from the 17th century are being misinterpreted to defend some sort of fake original sense of um, what they would have meant in that time period, we have obligations to do a better job of expanding that past to show it in its full variety that is there, to do a better job of bringing the public into that work and of bringing that work out into the public. And finally, I want to come back to counting and to categorizing. We categorize things as bibliographers as a basic function of our work. But categorizations are not neutral and they're not locked into place. Just because we used to see books as existing in one way doesn't mean that they have always existed in that way. Just because we are insistent that these definitions meant something in the 19th century does not mean that they mean the same thing today. We cannot do the work that we need to do if we cannot expand our own senses of how we support that work and who is included in that work. Thank you. I don't have a final slide. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, this bit of rainbow printing works very well. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. That was a, a absolutely fantastic talk. And thank you especially for explaining so persuasively why the kind of work that we do with historical texts, whether they're printed or written or take any other form, are so important for influencing the, the rights and uh, very much a life and death matter, uh, especially for women today um, in the present and, and in the future. There are a number of questions I would love to ask. Um, but I'm sure that we have some in the uh, among the audience. So um, if anybody would like to raise your hand, please raise your hand uh, virtually uh, below if you click on raise hand uh, or type your question in the chat. Um, I think in the meantime, Sarah, I'd, I'd also like to thank you for pointing out that um, libraries are often based on, on gentlemen's collections. Um, there are a number of anecdotes I can, uh, can share about this and the way these spaces can be made unwelcoming, uh, especially to women who are younger, lesbian, feminine, um, of color, the list goes on. I uh, thank you very much for bringing that. I, I saw that the Newbury Library is now bringing in um, old adjustable height table sits down desks, oh. um, which is wonderful for people who have a range of disabilities or um, like me tend to be much shorter than the average gentleman collector and find these desks incredibly uncomfortable. Um, so it's very nice to see. And I think that was announced today, um, earlier this afternoon, it might've been yesterday, that there are some people taking very real steps to try to counter the, the physical needs of a range of users of, of robot collections. Um, to start the questions, can I ask you what you think is next? So there are a lot of difficulties, there are a lot of obstacles, there's a lot of work to do. 
what do we do tomorrow when we set out to walk in your footsteps? Um, I'm glad you asked that because I just am realizing that I, I had kind of meant actually to wrap it up on a more optimistic looking forward note. So, so um, I want to sort of like say two things and this actually weirdly comes back to um, some of the um, instabilities of the material world and what's happening with um, the denial of access to safe and legal abortions in the United States is that there are there are people who've been doing this work for a very long time. Um, there are existing networks, existing radicalizations, existing um, funds available that we don't have to invent a new world from scratch because there have people who have already done that invention. And in large part, those people who have already done that work um, are people who are much more used to having had their bodily autonomy controlled. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. for a lot of um, middle and upper class white cis women, this is a mm -hmm. shock. But for many other women and people of um, and non-binary and trans mm -hmm. folks, this is not a shock. They've known for forever that our bodies are being legalized. Um, and I feel like with um, a similar sort of thing I see happening in the bibliographical world, I do, I love that in the last, I wanna say kind of five-ish years, maybe, I feel like there's been a real, maybe 10 years, a real, shift in thinking about sort of like analyzing the tools that we use, thinking, expanding the, the range of materials that um, we cover. And so I think that work is, is happening. And I, and given the precarity of academia and of libraries in general, I, I see it kind of the way that folks like Mariam Kaba and Dean Spade see like this isn't the world is breaking and this is an opportunity for us to remake it in ways that we want to remake it. So it is not just see the lack of funding as being a problem, which it is, but maybe this is an opportunity to reimagine new structures and new grants. One specific example, um, and then I want to sort of hear from the question is, for instance, during because of the pandemic and because of the lockdowns, a lot of libraries, I don't know about a lot, some libraries have used this opportunity to expand the type of research fellowships that they offer so that those can be research funds that can be used even if you cannot be on site for a full three months. And that happened explicitly because, you know, it's a pandemic and there was a brief moment of time when people thought maybe we shouldn't actually be traveling and gathering together. Apparently we no longer think that and we're just gonna gather and travel or some of us will just continue to refuse to do that. Um, but I'm hoping that that will mean that there will be these new opportunities that have opened up that allowed people who have kids, um, allowed people who have um, physical mobility issues that make it problematic to work in a lot of these libraries, which are also physically really not accessible to anybody who um, is not walking on their legs. Um, I, I think that that's, that's an indication that there's new, that there's hunger there if we can figure out how to think differently about our problems. Thank you. I think uh, we do have questions, but very quickly, I, you might be thinking of a different example, but I do know the Folger has uh, really led the way in offering um, yeah. remote. They were um, lucky because they space. were already scheduled to be closed before the pandemic hit. So yeah. instead of having to scramble the way that other institutions then did, it turned out that they already had prepared, but, but I don't know what the plans are um, for after the reopening, for what sort of fellowships they're going to be offering, but absolutely during the closure, they've been great on that. And we're also at a, a very different moment now with uh, digital facsimiles than we were even five years ago. Yeah. And so it's much more possible to undertake original research, copy specific research, including an uncatalogued aspects of materials for Millie. So it's really wonderful that um, these initiatives are, are taking place. But I see we have a question, an anonymous question. How has the digitization of early printed books changed or how could it change the way that bibliographers can do their work to be more inclusive? Mm. It's, I, I think well, it's exactly what we were just talking about in part. Um, 
I do really believe that there are things it is possible to digitize, to create digital facsimiles of early printed books in a high enough level of res resolution that you can really get a lot of bibliographical information out of it, mm -hmm. um, or at least enough bibliographical information to determine whether or not you actually need to see it in person, which maybe is all that we really need. Um, it depends in part on perhaps on, on libraries rethinking what they're prioritizing in digitizing and how they digitize them. Um, so I'm thinking about the ways in which um, was is, is still standard practice for a lot of places that when they image a book, what they think that they're imaging is the text. And so they prioritize lighting yes. it in ways that the page is flat. I know I hate it, mm -hmm. and, but it does make it much easier to read. But it destroys visual evidence of so many other aspects. Oh, I know. No, I totally, I totally agree. I agree. Right. And so, so part, so part of that, I think that um, we have the imaging tools to do things differently, and it's a matter of convincing. I, I think convincing the people who make those decisions that um, researchers, including other librarians um, and and sort of academic scholars want to see images offering different information, right? So that instead of just prioritizing the text, like, nope, we actually want to see the, the cockles and the texture of it. We don't want to see a fake, fat, flat page. Um, so I do think that there's, there's real opportunities there. Um, the other thing I'll say, because I have on other occasions talked about this as well, is there is a, there's a cost to digitizing things. And I don't just admit a monetary cost, which there is. Um, those of you who work in libraries know that you, that digitizing an object, creating a, a, just, just an image facsimile of it. I'm not even talking about like TEI and markup and all that. I'm just talking about like an image of the object um, also requires usually conservation. It requires cataloging. It requires metadata control. There's a lot of steps of this that are really important. Um, and it also has a, um, an ecological impact. Um, data servers really are a problem for the planet. Um, we are in a place of, I'm, I just like bring joy everywhere I go. We are in a place of, of ecological crisis on top of all the other crises we're having. Um, and there's, that doesn't mean that we don't digitize things, but I would really love to see more collaboration and communication between places. So a lot of digitized digitization programs have, I think this is shifting now, but in the first couple of decades, they really focused on sort of like their treasures. Um, this is one of the reasons why there are so many digital facsimiles of the first folio in the Gutenberg Bible but hardly any of Benjamin Banneker's early almanacs, which are incredibly important, um, not just for the DC area, <laughs> which he, in any case, he's a, he's a local DC hero as he should be. Um, but so like we, there's a much broader range out there of objects that could be digitized if we were to sort of work collaboratively. And then maybe we won't be filling up space um, in the carbon cloud with unnecessary. Thank you. There's so much to say about the completely unmonitored um, environmental cost of the digital humanities more broadly. Yeah. Um, I do hope that funders will at some point start adding in a box that says, what is the carbon cost of this project over the next five years, 10 years? That was an excellent point. Um, there's, a, there's some interesting other implications as well. Um, there are significant holdings of, of our books uh, in gender-specific collections, uh, for example, monastic libraries. Um, for which men or, or women are not allowed to enter. Um, I know somebody, a PhD student of mine, actually, a wonderful scholar, has been doing some research in one of these collections, and gender-based access is a very real yeah. um, restriction. Um, and so it's very exciting to think about digitization in and of itself being a way that barriers of accessibility can be broken down. That's so um, interesting. And also, wait, just as an aside, and then I've got to follow up with you more about this. It also sort of really interesting so that this, the physical space is gender specific, but somehow the digital, I'm not questioning this. I'm just pointing out there's sort of like weird dissociation. There's a lot like, of nuance like, here that there's no time to go into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm, we're going to follow up on this because that's really interesting. But I do think that it really does open up access in all sorts of, all sorts of ways in the monastic institutions. That's a good point of that. Um, I've been sent an anonymous question that follows onto that about cataloging. 
Um, and I see that we have additional uh, questions in the chat. One of them is about categorization. Um, maybe we'll answer the, would you like to answer the question about uh, cataloging and then move on to the question about categorization? Sure. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, so we'll have to be very brief. Um, the question about cataloging, once you, the question is once you digitize something, how do, uh, how do you make it accessible? How do you decide what features to describe? Um, another, I might want to add one of my other wonderful PhD students is um, in fact, there's government funding to go through and effectively look through a historic collection of, of um, medical books because evidence of women's ownership was systematically ignored in all previous cataloging drives. And she's um, identifying evidence of a women's ownership of medical knowledge. And I'm aware of similar other projects um, that, that take place in other institutions that are going on at the minute. Yeah. Um, so the, I believe that the question would be, how can we effectively re-catalog or use digital initiatives to catalog aspects that are not currently cataloged? Um, so if I've misunderstood that, please do uh, follow up with uh, with another comment and I will clarify if you're the person who wrote that question. Thank you. I, I you know, honestly, the, the, the first answer that comes to mind about that question is, um, uh, comes back to sort of like uh, collaboration and joint projects and some sort of version of crowdsourcing. Um, and it, partly because I'm thinking about uh, the, her book, Pro, pro, project. I don't. I can't even think of the names. I see it mostly as a hashtag. Yeah. Some of you know I'm on Twitter a lot, and I learn a lot on Twitter. And one of the things that I I see is the, the Herbuck hashtag, and I love that in part because it's a group of people that see that I don't even know how closely affiliated they are with each other. They're at dis different institutions, and they absolutely, the project seems to absolutely welcome contributions from anybody. So that you could be like, hey, I'm in this library and I was working with this book, but I see all this provenance information, like inscriptions from Elizabeth to Sarah in it. Um, and so I do think, yes, thank you. It's that. Um, the, there's the, the link, the link that now. Elizabeth just dropped in. Um, and so I think that that's thinking more. Cataloging is funny because it's not actually a possessive sort of outcome. Like people don't really sign their catalog records. I think they should and in some places they do, but in a lot of places it goes against institutional mm -hmm. practice. Um, and that has to do with the false divide between um, scholarship at researching and yeah. caring for collections and a false yeah. hierarchy that's implied yeah. in that. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. And yeah. that is also a hugely gendered thing that I didn't really mm -hmm. come up in my talk, but that, that division, yeah. and that's partly about the weird history of the Bowers stuff and the, and the concern about is bibliography of science and how do we differentiate ourselves from librarians and just mm -hmm. book collectors and there's all sorts of gender stuff going on with that. Um, so I think mm -hmm. if we were to be able to fight against those impulses, um, it would be a very, I hate to say cost effective, but that's the word I'm going to use, it would be a very cost effective mm -hmm. way to create a broader base of records that people could draw from. Um, it's not going to convince your supervisors that you should spend more time cataloging every book that's in your collection. Um, but there are ways in which you can use readers input in your, in your readers or collect with other ones. I mean, like if you're, if you're, and the other thing I'll just add about this, especially with um, digitization and tagging and describing and all of that sort of stuff is that any single image cannot do everything. So if you're going to image a book, you need to just you need to decide what uses you want to prioritize for that. And so maybe what you want to prioritize are um, maybe maybe in that case you're really interested in provenance stuff, and so you really want to pay attention to actually making sure that you get inscriptions in the fly leaves. Imaged fly leaves are not always imaged, which is really annoying. Um, so all sorts of those kinds of um, you can't do everything. I just want, I, and, and we are, we are all, whether you are a, think of yourself as a librarian, or if you think of yourself as like a scholar, we are all being asked to do too much. I guarantee it. Um, and so I do not want to think that we should do even more. I want to think about trade-offs and balances and working together in ways that are, I think, um, more satisfying than being stuck on your own. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, there's a very, very thorough answer. We are running out of time. Um, 
So at this point, I'd like to read out the questions that we don't have time to answer in case that can foster further discussion um, outside of this presentation. And then afterwards, I'd like to ask everyone to, to uh, join me in thanking Sarah. Um, we have uh, we have a comment about Maria Sibylla Marion's work, uh, 15045, on Suriname, based on the wisdom of local enslaved people and indigenous folks, has um, 60 botanical fauna plates that shows the plant commonly used as an abortion potion. Um, there is actually a huge amount of information about, um, about abortion and historical printed books, so it isn't always specifically identified using terms that we would use today. Thank you very much for that comment. Uh, we have a comment, since you mentioned categorization, um, an organiza we're looking for an organizational structure, Madeline Fair says, um, for secondhand bookstores. What are your thoughts on Dewey, Library of Congress, and BISAC? Um, and that is very interesting. Dewey is hugely problematic. Uh, for example, in the, distinct, the distinction between African-American literature versus American literature. So this could be the topic of uh, <laughs> a great deal of discussion. Um, Yu Nakamura has said uh, regarding the limitations on financial support, the historians of Netherlandish art have expanded their fellowship call to include subvention for coverage of childcare or related costs to make research and writing time possible. That's wonderful. Um, and has addition, additional information on the taxiderming of a, of a ray um, and comments about the, the cost of cataloging and description and how that's compromised. Uh, again, there could be gendered elements of that to, uh, to discuss. And then we have two last questions. Uh, coming to this talk, this is anonymous, after attending the USTC's conference on manuscript and print, your comment on libraries as institutions that help define what a book is, is something we've heard much about. What are the next steps that libraries as institutions can take to be more inclusive? Again, a huge, huge topic for discussion, very rich. And then finally, Sarah Pike has said, much feminist and queer print culture is DIY, radical, ephemeral, uh, posters and flyers, for example. Um, and of course, because it has to be destroyed, destroyable, destructible to be safe. Um, what is gained and what is lost when this material is brought to the institution of the academic library and university and subject to bibliographical or book historical disciplinary strictures? Again, um, all excellent questions. Uh, so there is much to discuss. Uh, and I, I do hope you will be able to join us in future to pick up these lines of discussion. Um, but you are con contactable through your website. Um, yes, yes. Feel, I, I love to hear, um, if you want to just drop the early printed, yeah, if you just sarahwarner.net, that's my that's my website, sarahwarner.net, that will get you to anything else I produce, and I'll also have my email address on it. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I always okay, love just added that stuff, um, and I learn, these are great questions, I learned so much from being able to talk with, with people about that, so um, absolutely feel free to, to reach out there or Twitter or whatever is comfortable for you. And hopefully someday I'll be over in person and we can have some of these conversations again. Wonderful. Well, I've learned so much as always, and I've greatly enjoyed the being in conversation with you after that excellent talk. I thank you so much for everything that you have done and are doing for the field. Um, so I, I would like you to, um, to feel welcome to join me in thanking Sarah with applause with video, uh, with the emoji for applause or, or sending your comments in the chat. Um, we are four minutes over time, so we'll need to wrap this up now. But Sarah is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed this.